Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 3 part 2 of Standby Nuki Zoo's All About. Now I'm going to be talking to you about amphibians. I'm going to be giving you again a brief history of amphibians and their origins, some of their key characteristics, the certain types that you'll be able to find in the UK and in modern day, and how you yourself can help UK's amphibians and protect them from any future threats. History and Evolution Fossil records show that amphibians evolved from fish around 400 million years ago, which is 100 years before reptiles. This was also during the Carboniferous period. This period of evolution from fish to amphibian occurred in the Devonian period and took around 50 million years. Amphibians were the first to become what's known as tetrapods. Tetrapods are basically any creature that have four limbs, which are used to support itself. One of the earliest species of amphibian or tetrapod was called Archamptheostega, which can be seen, its fossil can be seen here, and an artist's reconstruction can be seen here. The fossil records show that this creature still did have gills, like a fish, but did have four distinct limbs which showed the evolution from fish into amphibian. Although tetrapods were amphibian-like, it was not until 320 million years, around 80 million years later, we see the first true amphibians which are similar to modern-day amphibians such as frogs and salamanders. Although not as impressive as their the nearby group, the reptiles, like dinosaurs in size, the early amphibians did reach impressive size of around about 15 foot with species such as Enchirenus, which can be seen here, along with other species uh, compared to a human, not quite as big as some of the dinosaurs reached, but still fairly impressive for that earlier on. Later down the line in the Permian period, much like reptiles, the amphibians also split into two groups. Group 1 were the Group 1 were the leper spondules, which were smaller and more slimy skin, and some examples can be seen here. And the second group were called temnospondrules, which were larger slightly more reptilian looking but still amphibians and were semi-aquatic and more likely had less slimy skin which are some of the examples of the larger ones here. Amphibians today mostly consist of frogs. Um, the first ancestor to all frogs uh, was a species called the triple frog uh, which evolved 250 million years ago and an artist's reconstruction of it can be seen here. It had a small tail, wasn't quite, the hind legs weren't quite as developed as modern day frogs, but this is the best guess as to the ancestor for most frogs and salamanders today. The types of amphibians that we have today are split into three groups. We have the most common group, group one, which is the frogs. Frogs belong to the genus Anura. They are the most diverse group and have up to around 6,000 species. Most of these species can be found in tropical areas and tropical rainforests like the Amazon. And they are, but they are still everywhere in the world other than Antarctica. Frogs are unique for their specialist movement type with their more developed hind legs allowing them to hop instead of walk or run. The second group are the salamanders. The salamanders belong to the genus Eurydella. They have around about 620 species and don't have a unique movement. They usually just walk by swaying from their limbs from left to right. Most have no lungs to expire through and just expire through their skin or their gills. 
and the group of um, reptiles that are fairly common in the UK, the newts, also belong to this group. The last group are the Sicilians. They belong to the genus Arpoda, have around about 185 species. This group lack any limbs, however, they were seen to have had a common ancestor that did have limbs, but evolved to not have any. They mostly live underground and burrow, and because of this, they are almost fully blind. This group is the least known species of amphibian and are mostly mistaken for worms. So what makes an amphibian? Here are some of the key characteristics of amphibians. One of their most key characteristics that's unique to their group, vertebrate group, is their reproduction methods. Most amphibians reproduce in fresh water. They must lay their eggs in water so they don't dry out. Their eggs are covered in a jelly-like substance. This is used for protection against predators. Most species go through a larval stage, so your classic tadpole into adult stage. Earlier in life, they are fully aquatic, and eventually their lungs start to develop, as well as their limbs, as they make their movement more towards being a land-based creature. The second characteristic is the respiration. They have very primitive lungs, which do not diffuse oxygen into the blood as well, compared to mammals and reptiles. They also cannot hold as much oxygen as reptile or amphibian lungs. Because of this, they also respire through their skin. Their skin is permeable and it needs to be kept moist. Moist skin increases the rate of oxygen diffusion into blood, which is why it's important that amphibians always live near a water source. This type of respiration through the skin is a type of respiration called cutaneous respiration. Another characteristic of amphibians is that all adult amphibians are exclusively carnivores slash insectivores. They usually feed on creatures such as spiders, worms, beetles, small mammals, caterpillars, and eggs. Sicilians mostly feed on types of worms and will sometimes be feed on small burrowing mammals and mammal eggs. And obviously their main characteristic, which kind of defines them and gives them their name, is that they do both live on land and water. The word amphibian comes from the Greek Greek word amphibian and translates to living a double life. Amphibians start off in the water in the larval stage as their tadpoles and eventually move towards being on land, become more terrestrial, but amph all amphibians must still have a water source to live nearby in order to be able to reproduce, lay their eggs and keep their skin moist so they can still diffuse oxygen and breathe. Much like the reptiles, amphibians are also cold-blooded and because of this being in the UK, our temperatures are not amazingly optimal for a large diversity of amphibians. So this is our seven native species of amphibian. Um, from left to right, the first one you see here is the Natterjack toad. Then we have the common toad. This common toad is currently on the decline in its population. It's faced a 60% decline in the past 10 or 20 years. This is mostly due from deaths due to road construction and cars, and also just general habitat loss of more urbanization in the UK. If there's nothing done to the common frog in terms of management or conservation, we may not be able to see it very commonly at all, or could go extinct in the UK by 2030. Next we have the common frog, this is still pretty widespread out. We then have the pool frog, this frog was actually thought to have been extinct in the 90s, but is now only found in one small site in Norfolk. Next we have the newts, 
This first newt is the palmate newt. It's the smallest species that we have in the UK. Still pretty widespread around the UK. We next have the great crested newt. This can be found in some places around the UK, such as Cornwall. The great crested newt, its population is lower than the rest. It is starting to become more vulnerable and there are conservation efforts at the moment being put to try and aid its population. And lastly, we have the smooth newt, which is still fairly common around the UK and its population is stable at the moment. But on the whole, a lot of the amphibians' this population is slowly decreasing. Unlike with the reptiles with the adder, none of these species are really dangerous. None of them uh, have any poison skin or whatnot. Um, so when surveying or finding any of them in the garden, there's nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, amphibians are one of the worst groups in terms of how many species that are vulnerable and threatened for extinction. Around 41% of all amphibians do face extinction. Their main threats include habitat loss and degradation. This is mostly in tropical areas again by logging and forest clearing and just general decrease of large forest areas and water sources in place for farms. Another main threat is invasive species. Another threat is climate change. This is mostly through global warming increasing temperatures, which means there's more forest fires and drought. And forest fires and drought are very bad for amphibians. Their skin always needs to be moist, else they're not going to be able to breathe and respire properly. And they need the water sources in order to reproduce and lay their eggs. Another one of their main threats is chytrid fungus. Also the rain of virus that was mentioned in the reptile talk, it's a new virus, but chytrid fungus is their main enemy at the moment. This image here shows a frog that has been infected with chytrid fungus. Chytrid fungus basically covers the adult frogs. It doesn't affect tadpoles, but it covers the adult frogs. It hardens their skin, which allows salts not to get through their skin anymore. and Eventually, with no salts getting in through their skin, their hearts and circulatory system would eventually start to fail and their heart would not be able to beat anymore. And they would also slowly suffocate from not being able to respire through their skin. In the UK, the biggest threat is mostly through human involvement. Um, the construction of roads and road deaths, you see in this image here. It's a fairly common sight to see a toad or a frog like this in the UK. Another threat is the pet trade. This is links to invasive species as well. In the wild, a lot of these frog species can come in bright colours and be very pretty and very appealing to people and collectors. Um, and they can sell for a lot of money. So a lot of the people are collecting these frogs from the wild, taking them from the wild and putting them into the pet trade. Ways that you can help UK's amphibians. The ways that you can help is very similar to the way that you can help reptiles. The main one is to be create garden ponds. These ponds need to be fairly um, non-steep, like have slow edges in order to allow amphibians to be able to get in and out of the water. These provide places for the reptile, reptiles and amphibians um, to live and shelter in. And it's also a good place for amphibians to lay their eggs. It's important that these ponds do not contain any fish, such as koi, as fish are a natural predator of all amphibians and do eat the frog spawn or salamander eggs. It's also important that in these ponds to use UK native plant species and to allow these plants and vegetation to grow around the edges of the pond to allow more cover from predators. Another way you can help is to create compost heaps. Again, amphibians like reptiles are also cold-blooded ectothermic and compost heaps provide a nice warm place um, to hibernate 
and to increase their body temperatures during colder periods. Another way is longer grass. Longer grass allows protection from predators. They have similar predators to UK's reptiles, such as birds and even everyday house cats and pets. Another way is to avoid pesticides and slug repellents. Along with chemical, chemical contamination, uh, it's a big issue for amphibians because of their skin being permeable and them living in water. If the air or the water is infected with chemical contaminants, those chemicals can end up diffusing through their skin, into their skin, which could dry up their skin, it can lead to internal problems, poisoning, blood poisoning, and birth defects um, from infected individuals, offspring. Another way is to leave any frog spawn that you find in a pond alone. Don't even try to relocate it. And another main way is to report any signs of disease. Um, so if you see any individuals that look like they may be infected by chytrid fungus or there is a, a group of reptiles or maybe your local pond is seeing more increase in amphibian deaths is a good way to report it so it can be investigated and any infected individuals can be contaminated so we can stop the spread of chytrid fungus and other diseases that affect amphibians. And similar to reptiles, if you want to support reptiles across countries, different countries and tropical places, um, lots of uh, online conservation projects by the WWF um, that goes into supporting research into chytrid fungus to try and stop the spread, come up with a, a better cure for it, and to also help reduce deforestation and habitat loss in these places where amphibian diversity is a lot higher. And with that, that concludes Reptile and Amphibian Day. Um, thank you all for listening, and I hope you now know a bit more about reptiles and amphibians. And like I said before, Nuki Zoo is back open on the 12th of April um, in their tropical house with their reptiles. They do have quite a few species of amphibians, such as the poison dart frogs. So you can come along and view them whenever you want. There is a link in the description for a donation to Nuki Zoo to help them recover back up from the lockdown period and to help them if we do go back into another lockdown and any money that's given to the zoo is put directly back into conservation projects. If you have any questions, please be sure to comment below and we'll try and answer them as quickly as possible. Other than that, have a great rest of your week and next week is fish week and possibly invertebrate week.